Hi, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us for our webinar named Build Back Better Wealth Planning After a Financial Catastrophe, featuring attorney Jay Sherrill of Sherrill Law PC. Today, we're going to go over a couple things um, in detail with Jay, and we just ask that you don't uh, put any questions or important proprietary information in the chat. Please uh, wait till the end and we'll address all your questions at the end. Uh, this is also not legal advice, this is legal information. Everyone in this current webinar is in listen and view only mode and the microphone and videos are disabled just for reference. And without further ado, uh, here is Jay Cheryl of Cheryl Law PC. Hi, right, thank you, Courtney. Welcome, everybody. So excited to be doing this today. Uh, just uh, another point about uh, questions. So we often get a lot of questions as we go through our material. Uh, please enter those questions into the Q&A. We'll answer those at the end. Uh, that way you can enter the questions as you go when you see them. Um, but that way we can tackle the questions together at the end when we get to that point. Uh, great, fantastic. So looking into diving into Build back better. So, how, what can we do from an estate planning perspective after a financial catastrophe? We're we talking about bankruptcy, uh, and look, this is bankruptcy really meaning is a fresh start. Uh, so, this is a great time to revisit this idea of planning and planning for the future. And likely, when you emerge from bankruptcy, we do have assets left. There are a lot of exemptions that you leave with that it's worthwhile protecting. Also, uh, a lot of times the, the catastrophe that we find ourselves in is a, an issue from uh, a, a catastrophe of some sort of financial obligation, uh, which medical and, and legal costs can be a big part of that. So a lot of what estate planning is, is risk management, again, to help future uh, issues from ever becoming an issue where you have to find yourself back in bankruptcy. So first, just a little bit, a little bit about me and, and our firm. Uh, we are a firm on the east end of Long Island that is dedicated to helping people plan their legacy, protect their assets, and leave a, a future for their children, uh, for their loved ones, for their family. Uh, I was talking today with somebody and we talked about what does it really mean to be prepared? Is it really to be prepared for yourself or is it to be prepared so that way when it's needed, you are there to be of service to others? And this is really what estate planning is because so often the estate plan isn't necessarily about you. It's about those that you are prepared to help with yourself and not leaving them in a uh, difficult situation or more difficult than it has to be. A little, bit, a little bit about me. I am the uh, managing attorney and founding attorney of Cheryl Law PC. Uh, this is why I do what I do. This is my, my wife and I, actually, we were kids. Uh, this, I just want to show you our family because this is what it's all about. Uh, this was me uh, when I first started on the journey to becoming an attorney. I actually had no idea that I wanted to be an attorney. I didn't have this grand design, but I had always been a problem solver. Here, I was a, a traffic control officer. Uh, helping people, uh, helping the police department rather, uh, write tickets for people at the beach. Uh, and I, I decided I would go back to school at that point to study uh, law. And I had never found anything, well, study criminal justice to become a, a, a police officer. And I had never, uh, I had taken a class in criminal justice about this time, criminal law. And it was the first time that I ever found uh, a class that I actually liked to study for. So I kind of went with that, took some more classes, uh, business law, constitutional law. I said, you know, I really like this. Got my first job in a law firm around 21. Uh, and this was just been a career, a passion of mine to help people solve problems. Uh, and why estate planning for me, though, is because of these happy moments, the children, marriages, it's my wife and I on our wedding day, uh, our children. This is what we do this for. This is who we do this for. This is uh, our future. Uh, leaving and being prepared and leaving a legacy for these people is what is all key. But what led me to start our practice here, because I had been working for other people doing this type of work, was my second daughter here. She was born premature. And I just realized that life is fragile and that there are people out there that need me, need our services of our team. And we're going to build a, a team around this to be able to help deliver comprehensive estate planning services for people like you. So that way you are protected and your loved ones are protected in the future. And this is my girls. Well, it's, it's the whole picture. We should update this, Courtney. But it's uh, it's about uh, two years ago now at this point. The girls are five and six now. Uh, this the little one there in the back. That's Lily, who you saw in the pre previous picture. Uh, she's actually now losing her first tooth. So, uh, so why am I so passionate about uh, state planning? It's because these are the rules of the game. 
Um, the, the laws are complicated and they are there are traps, there are landmines, and there are missed opportunities for those that don't know their options. Simply by uh, not doing anything, you're actually doing something. You're off, uh, actually giving up opportunities that you may have, uh, or you're also allowing default designations to be made on behalf of you about your money, about your health, by uh, state law, uh, where you haven't had any. enormous, enormous disadvantage. The other piece that we do to help with people and why I do this is because there's so much misinformation. I mean, think about it. How many times have you heard, oh, my friend did this or my friend did that, or uh, thy friend said, don't do this. I had someone in yesterday, they said, oh, I keep hearing all these things about uh, irrevocable trust, for example. And they said, don't do one. And I said, uh, if you ask those people, how many of those people do you think actually have one and know a damn thing about it? And the answer would be zero because they don't have them. So there's just so many myths and misinformation. So let's talk about estate planning and bankruptcy. So we're going to break this down into two sections today. Uh, part of this is targeted if you have filed for bankruptcy. And the second piece that we're going to tackle is if uh, one of your beneficiaries, one of your loved ones that you want to provide for has filed for bankruptcy. So one, the things that you should be doing if you have filed for bankruptcy yourself, or two, how you have to plan or should plan for someone that has uh, uh, declared bankruptcy. And no, the answer does not have to be disinherit them. So let's start with if you are the one who has filed for bankruptcy. The first thing we need to get in our mind is that the estate planning is about protecting your money and your property. We want to be able to protect your money, protect your property for your loved ones. So how do we do that? Well, again, like I mentioned before, we, we likely are emerging from bankruptcy with, uh, with a, a, uh, some assets, assets that are protected assets that are exempt for the purposes of the bankruptcy proceeding. So it is important that the beneficiary designations for any of the accounts or policies that you retained after the bankruptcy, this is things like such as life insurance policies or retirement accounts, you need to make sure that the beneficiaries are completed. Okay, we see a big issue with this all of the time. Something came in the mail, I needed to update the beneficiary designation, it was missed. There's no beneficiary on the life insurance policy, right? There's no beneficiary on the right retirement account. These things can be catastrophic because now we have to bring in a state proceeding to, because they get a court act, you know, court action, a court involved in transferring these assets when it really would have been as simple as. Uh, sending in a check or sending in a form that would be able to, to handle it. So, I mean, if you fail to complete these required forms, the money may be paid over to your estate, and that necessitates a costly and time-consuming probate process. But it also might mean that it goes to individuals that you didn't even plan for. It, instead of it going to the who you thought were the beneficiaries listed under the life insurance policy, or the retirement account, it could actually go to what's called your intestate heirs. And this is this basically the state will, the, the list of people who get your assets when you pass away, uh, if you don't prepare a will. Now, sometimes that lines up with what you want, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, for example, if you're married and have children, typically a person will want 100% of their assets to go to their surviving spouse. But that's not what the intestate statute says. The intestate statute says that that money should go to the kids also. So it's roughly 50-50, but about 50% to the surviving spouse and about 50% to the children. Now, I have never seen a client that that's exactly what they intended. And the key is, even if it does match, you need to make sure that it does. You don't know if it does. So in addition, though, if it's going through probate, your retirement account may have be subject to unintended income tax consequences because you have a lot of opportunity to leave your retirement accounts in a specific way that allows your beneficiaries the ability to stretch distributions out of the account uh, for as long as allowable under current IRS and New York State rules. So that way the assets in the retirement account can continue to grow tax-free and only be taxed on the required minimum distributions that are being forced out of the account. But if we leave it to the estate instead, because we don't have beneficiary designations, all of that money might actually have to come out of that retirement account 
all at once. And when it does, that could have unintended income tax consequences, meaning that the net effect of your estate is reduced by increased expenses. Now, I don't know about you, uh, but myself and most of the clients that we work with don't like to write additional voluntary uh, checks to the government if we don't need to. So we want to be cognizant of those things. Okay, the next thing is we need to take a look at is your last will and testament. So we talked about beneficiaries. Next is your last will and testament. In the last will and testament, it's also called a will. You name an executor, what we call it, or a personal representative. And it's in, in New York, we call this an executor who collects all of your accounts and property, pays out your outstanding debts, and distributes the money and property to the beneficiary, beneficiaries that you named. Okay, so you name in the document beneficiaries, you name in the document an executor, that executor has to collect all of your accounts and your money and your assets, pay any debts off, and then distribute the assets, the net assets to the named beneficiaries. Your will also specifies who receives your accounts and property at death. And if you have minor children, we can name a guardian for your minor children, the person who would be in charge of having custody over your children if you were to pass away while they were still minors, okay? Having a will requires that your loved ones go through the probate process, though. So if you die owning accounts or property in your sole name without a beneficiary designation, like we discussed, that is where your will comes in, okay? Now, not every count can have a beneficiary designation, because we would love to just set up beneficiary designations on everything so everything can avoid probate. But you, after your bankruptcy, are likely sitting with one large asset that cannot necessarily have a beneficiary on it, or not easily have a beneficiary on it. And that would be a piece of real estate. And so we still want to try to avoid probate. And that's where a revocable living trust comes in. A revocable living trust is created during your lifetime in which you can name yourself as the current trustee and designate a co-trustee or a successor trustee, if you wish, and you are unable to act for any reason. This means that you can still be in control of your assets, okay? Unlike some other trust planning, which was beyond what we'll talk about today, uh, in a revocable trust, you maintain control over your assets. You don't lose any control. Now, during your lifetime, Ownership of your accounts and property is changed from your name individually to your name as trustee of the trust, okay? So there's a title change that happens, but by making that title change, we can avoid probate and keep it out of your probate estate for which we need to use that last will and testament that we talked about. Now, most importantly with the revocable living trust is that you continue to enjoy the, the benefits of your own property by, named, by being named as the trust beneficiary. So as long as you're living, you'll be the trust beneficiary. So you can maintain control over your assets and enjoy those assets, enjoy that income, use the property, spend the money without any qualification from anybody but by simply having done that step of creating a revocable living trust, you can avoid that lengthy court process. Now the trust outlines, much like a will, how the money and property are to be used during your life if you become incapacitated and also like a will at your death. Now with this document, management of all trust assets, property and money occurs outside of the probate court. It also makes it very easy for your trustee now, the trustee is what I mentioned here, like your co-trustee, your alternate trustee for if you were unable to act, like upon your passing. It makes it very easy for that co-trustee to know where your assets are. Remember with the will, one of the major tasks was to go about finding all your assets, gathering them up, retitling them to the estate. Here, you've done that already. You've made it easy. You don't have to worry about the executor trying to find these things, but then also going through the added step of retitling everything at that time. Now, it's also important to note that the revocable living trust does not provide you with any personal asset protection benefits. This won't protect you from lawsuits. This won't protect you from home health care and long-term care expenses, and it won't provide any estate tax planning. Uh, it's really a vehicle to streamline an estate and make the administration of the estate as easy as possible. So now what about, we talk about protecting money, protecting assets. What about protecting yourself? See, while planning for death is usually the main motivator for people to prepare an estate plan, we also focus on planning for what will happen if you are unable to make decisions for yourself. This is known as being incapacitated. 
there are serious questions that must be considered by everyone. The important decisions makers are named in this document and the following estate planning documents that we're going to talk about that will allow uh, you to be able to have key decision makers in place to help make these important healthcare related decisions and financial decisions. The first thing is a financial power of attorney. We call this in New York, it's a New York state statutory short form power of attorney. In a financial power of attorney, you name a trusted person, it's called an agent or an attorney in fact, those two terms are used interchangeably. Uh, you appoint this trusted person to handle your financial matters, such as signing checks or opening bank accounts. Uh, you can specify what the agent can do. You also can decide how to allow the agent to do almost anything the that you could do or limit the types of transactions to one specific action. Now, typically for an estate planning purposes, we recommend a power of attorney that is as broad as possible to allow your agent to do almost anything that you'd be able to do. And if you have hesitation about that, well, I'd, I'd suggest that we consider that maybe the agent you're suggesting that we appoint would not be the appropriate agent because of the person that we want to appoint in this scenario would be someone that we trust fully and completely. Where we might want a more limited power of attorney will be where we are doing a power of attorney for a limited transaction, such as a real estate closing. Uh, typically, those powers of attorney are limited in nature and what we call uh, non-durable, meaning they actually terminate upon you becoming incapacitated because we don't want to give that much power over to, say, uh, you know, a real estate attorney to do a real estate closing for you so you don't need to go to the closing to sign all the documents. That's not the type of power of attorney that we want here. So just know that not all powers of attorney are created equally. And the state statutory form can also be very misleading in that it doesn't really give all the powers uh, by default to allow your agent to do almost anything that you can do. We really need to craft those powers in. It takes having a dedicated estate planner that knows the additional powers that need to be added to add to that power of attorney. So that way you're not left with, uh, with, uh, with a power of attorney that's just not sufficient to meet your needs. Now, subject to New York state law, you can also choose when the agent can act. Now, uh, New York state law does allow for what's called a springing power of attorney. Uh, there's some risks associated that with that, meaning that, uh, that that power of attorney wouldn't go into effect until you needed it in the future. There's some pros and cons. And then before deciding on whether to do a springing power of attorney or a, uh, a just a regular power of attorney, I'd suggest you, you know, walk through those with a trusted advisor. Now, the agent may be able to act immediately or when you are incapacitated. And that's where that springing decision comes in. Now, without this document, a court will need to appoint a guardian, okay, if you don't have this, right? If you don't have a valid power of attorney or a power of attorney that gives enough powers, you'll need, the court will need to appoint a guardian if you need someone to handle your, a financial matter on your behalf. This often comes up for us where someone's trying to do estate planning and they have lost the capacity to do it. We then need to go to court first to have the court appoint a guardian before we can do the estate planning. So you can imagine that adds an additional stress, heartache, time uh, associated with that. The person selected by the court though, even after all of that, may not be the person that you would have chosen. So by you having chosen the power of attorney, you avoid the need to have a guardian appointed and also avoid the need or the possibility that uh, a, a person who you didn't even want to be the guardian could be named. You know, the court can actually appoint someone off a list that you don't even know. It's just a, people that serve as guardians that are called uh, part 36 guardians. So they're completely third party neutrals. And we've served in that role for people that don't have uh, family. They didn't do a power of attorney, have nobody that wants to serve. Uh, but I certainly don't want to see that where someone uh, didn't just, simply didn't just do a power of attorney. The next important document is a healthcare proxy. Now this document allows you to appoint a trusted person as your medical decision maker. So not the finances now, we're talking about the medical decisions. We can appoint a trusted person to act as your medical decision maker to communicate or to make healthcare decisions on your behalf if you cannot. Now without this, the court may be required to choose someone to make decisions for you. Now, in a hospital setting in New York, in an emergency setting, the state law will allow a list of people to act for those emergency decisions so we don't need to rush to court. That list may mean someone that you didn't want to be making these decisions is actually making these decisions. So it's important to have this healthcare proxy. 
Uh, now, the, again, the person that's selected by the court, if we're no longer in a hospital setting and we're, let's say, at home needing to make decisions about physicians and treatment, uh, that person may not be the person that you wanted. And again, can actually be a person off this Part 36 list, which is just a third party that you don't even know who this might be. So the key decisions that you can, can take control over simply by having planned in advance. Uh, the next piece here is called a living will. This is an advanced directive that allows you to convey your wishes about end of life to treatment. So what type of end of life treatment do you want? This can include your wishes regarding your care if you're diagnosed with a terminal illness or in a permanent vegetative state. Uh, generally, people will want something along the lines of, I don't want to be kept alive artificially. If I have no chance of recovery, I'm a terminal illness, permanent vegetative state. I want to die comfortably and naturally and don't want that uh, treatment that's only going to pro prolong the dying process. And, uh, and that our main goal would be to die naturally and comfortably. So please do administer pain relief, uh, even if that does speed up uh, the, uh, my ultimate passing. And this can be really, really important because not only do you get to make your wishes known, this can also make it a lot easier on your healthcare agent and your loved ones that will be actually making these decisions for you. Uh, unfortunately, as a guardian, I've had to make these decisions for people without a living will. And it's very, very difficult to make these decisions knowing that I don't truly know what this person would have wanted. And I'm trying to now formulate my own opinion uh, with those around uh, her family members and other individuals, trusted advisors about what this person would have wanted. The best thing that you can do would to be to express these wishes in a living will so that everybody knows, your loved ones know, that we, that this is what you want. And this can serve to reduce tension and uncertainty among your loved ones at an already very stressful time. The next advanced directive that I recommend is a HIPAA authorization form. Now a HIPAA authorization form, well first HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, this is a, a, an act that provides for confidentiality of medical information for protected medical information. So this HIPAA form allows you to grant specific individuals access to your medical information, for example, to get a status update on your condition or to receive test results, okay, without giving those individuals the authority to make decisions on your behalf. So we certainly recommend giving that power over to your healthcare agents, but you can also allow other people you just want to have status updates on to have as an appointment of a HIPAA authorization. So that way they can just receive updates. There's no decision-making powers here. Now these individuals cannot make decisions on your behalf. However, provided uh, providing loved ones with information can help prevent conflicts between your chosen medical decision makers and your loved ones because no one's left in the dark. So we commonly see this where you might have multiple children and you're appointing only one as the healthcare proxy because we can only have one healthcare agent serving at any given time. That can often cause some discontent, distrust, tension, stress between children. It's a stressful situation. Uh, so by having uh, your other children, your other loved ones named as a HIPAA agent or HIPAA authorized individual, you can have now access to medical information to them as well to maybe alleviate some of that, that, uh, that uh, tension there and try to make things as smooth as possible. So now the next section we're going to talk about is if your loved one has filed for bankruptcy. So we've talked about what you should do if you file for bankruptcy, but if you have a beneficiary uh, and uh, you want to provide for them and they just filed for bankruptcy, well, what should you do? You know, you should be reviewing your estate plan at least every year and catching things like this. There's changes in circumstances, changes in life. This is one of them. So if you have a loved one who has filed for bankruptcy, you may question whether you should still provide for them at death or out of fear of whatever is left will be uh, wasted, you might want to think about disinheriting them. This concern might lead you to believe that the only way to protect yourself and your hard earned life savings is to disinherit them or make no provisions for the loved one who has filed bankruptcy. However, with a proper estate plan, it will allow you to provide for your loved one while also protecting your money and property. You do not have to disinherit your loved one, okay? We'll talk about what you might want to do. Now, if a beneficiary has a debt or judgment that must be satisfied, creditors can take the beneficiary's money or property as soon as the beneficiary receives it. 
okay? For this reason, you may stop giving gifts of money to your loved ones during your lifetime. However, money and property that you leave to your loved one at death can also be impacted by bankruptcy. Now, according to the bankruptcy code, any interest in property by bequest, devise, or inheritance through a, tax, uh, through a beneficiary designation, through a will, that's acquired by the debtor, so the person who filed for bankruptcy, on the date of filing or acquired within 180 days of the filing is part of the bankruptcy estate. So if they file for bankruptcy, you have to be keen on figuring out what happens there and should additional planning be done. Therefore, it's important that you review your existing plan to see if any money or property will be distributed outright to your loved one and create an estate plan with protective measures for your loved one. So it takes reviewing that at that time to make sure that, uh, that we catch what you have in your plan, whether it be trust beneficiaries, to make sure that we don't have anything paid to them within 180 days of the filing. Now, we obviously don't know the date of our death, right? Uh, and we know it's gonna come someday. I, I, I always suggest that people that were planning for the worst, obviously, and hoping for the best, that if you have a loved one, a child that's filed for bankruptcy, this is something that you give, you give pause to. So if you already have an estate plan, there are a few items you need to review if you find out that one of your loved ones has filed or is planning to file for bankruptcy. First, we'll look at who will receive your money and property and how they will receive it. So under beneficiary designations or under your last will and testament, going back to where we started about 15 minutes ago, those are the two main ways that we can leave assets behind. So we'll separate those two because it, it changes. So under beneficiary designations, it is common for people to name individuals as the beneficiaries of their life insurance policies, retirement accounts, and bank accounts. However, naming an individual means that upon your death, the money will be automatically turned over to that person in one lump sum with no protective measures. As soon as the money is in your loved one's bank account, it is susceptible to creditors, predators, and possibly a divorcing spouse. Now, what about under your last will and testament? Similarly, to make the process easy for, loved, easy for loved ones, many people will designate in their last will and testament that their beneficiary receives money or property outright without provisions to protect the money, property, or beneficiary. This is simple what I call I love you wills. Um, they just give it outright to a, a named beneficiary. Okay, now what about beneficiaries from your revocable living trusts? If you have decided to use a revocable living trust as part of your estate plan, you are probably aware of all the benefits a trust can provide. You'll want to review this document carefully to see if your loved one was named as a recipient of money, of property, and how they will receive it. That's the key. Next, you must review your documents to see if your loved one has been named as one of your important decision makers. Okay, Bankruptcy may actually disqualify one of your your agents, your executor, your fiduciaries, these people that are appointed to serve in fiduciary capacities. It might actually disqualify them from serving as an executor, a healthcare agent, a, a financial power of attorney. So if they are appointed in that role, you should consider if they're still capable of serving in that role, because if they are not capable, then you basically have a big blank, a big hole in the document. So when looking to revise or create your estate plan, a beneficial legal strategy is to use a discretionary trust for money rather than leaving the money outright. So if you use a discretionary trust for your money and property that you want to leave to your loved one instead of the outright I love you distribution, this is if we know this is going to be an issue. This can be included as a part of either your revocable living trust or your last will and testament. Now, note it cannot be provided as part of a beneficiary designation. So we need to review that planning then if this is a certain circumstance that you have. A discretionary trust is a trust in which the trustee, the person or entity you've chosen to be in charge of managing, investing, and handing out the money and property, where they use discretion as to when distributions of money or property are made to the beneficiary or on behalf of the beneficiary. Because your loved one will not be guaranteed that money because of the trustee's discretion, and they don't have a right to demand a specific amount of money at any given time or a piece of property at any given time. The funds can be protected from the loved one's creditors, predators, or even a divorcing spouse simply by having that discretion. 
Now, we certainly recommend putting somebody in your trust, whether that be a corporate trustee or knowing someone that will exercise that discretion in the way that you want that discretion to be authorized or exercised. Uh, now, specific to retirement accounts, they're treated a little differently. A standalone retirement trust can be used to protect this because we don't want to leave the, the beneficiary designation to, a, uh, to, to the individuals outright if they have these creditor issues. A standalone retirement trust is a special type of trust designed to be the beneficiary of your retirement accounts after you pass away. Now, if properly drafted, it can protect the retirement account funds from your beneficiary's creditors. In fact, we can include trust provisions that specifically protect the beneficiary in situations such as lawsuits from car accidents, business failures, malpractice, and bankruptcy. Okay, so listen, we covered a lot today. And, and today's up till this point, we've covered uh, how you should plan if you have just emerged from bankruptcy or thinking about filing for bankruptcy and the key estate planning documents that you're looking for, a will, a revocable living trust, and your advanced directives, which consist of that power of attorney, healthcare proxy, and living will. Uh, second, we talked about different ways that we can protect ourselves if one of our beneficiaries have filed for bankruptcy or are planning to file for bankruptcy. We talked about the, the pitfalls of leaving money to a beneficiary that's filed for bankruptcy outright, that they it actually may be part of their bankruptcy estate, subject to creditors, maybe subject to uh, uh, lawsuits from car accidents and bankruptcies and divorces, uh, malpractice if they're in a, a high law lawsuit uh, type of uh, practice like a physician. Uh, these can all be problems where you need to plan ahead. The key to knowing this though is that you don't quite know what the best solution is because these are, are very complicated pieces that need to be uh, tailored specifically to fit your particular needs. So what we recommend that you do is that you speak with an advisor about this, speak with an estate planning or elder law or asset protection attorney who can help you fit which is the best solution for you and how to do that. Now we offer a strategy session uh, for you to be able to help fit this in to see if this is something that you uh, need and how best to tailor the estate plan for you to protect those assets for your loved ones and not have them be subject to creditors and build back better your estate after your your uh, your bankruptcy. The way this works is it's a one hour meeting. We can do this for both virtual over Zoom or in person, depending on, on which you prefer. Uh, in this meeting, we will sit and go through your specific circumstances, okay? Discuss your desired goals and discuss how to maximize your options, right? Maximize your options to protect your wealth that you've worked hard for, the wealth that you've protected by acting smart and filing for bankruptcy, the wealth that you've earned and want to provide to a loved one who has filed for bankruptcy and, and leave a legacy behind that you want. Plus we'll answer any of the questions that I can't ask answer in, a, in this setting about your unique situation. So we'll, I hope you've been putting questions into the q and I'll be glad to answer those, but those will be very broad because I cannot give legal advice in this setting. Uh, but in this session, we can get really, really hyper-specific about your, your scenario. At the end of our time together, uh, you will leave with uh, knowing your options that you have. You'll be informed on what to do next, and you may hire us to implement the plan for you. So uh, naturally, at that strategy session, we won't be actually doing the plan. We'll be talking about the different options you have to accomplish those goals that you have. And we can go ahead at that time and discuss how to hire us to take care of that plan. Now, normally we charge $450 for that strategy session, but for the attendees of today's webinar, we are going to discount that down to $350. Uh, so we I'd ask you to book your session today. And to do that, we, you can go to www.startplanningnow.com to schedule. Uh, again, I guarantee that at the end of this meeting, you'll know your options, you'll have an actionable plan. And I will give you a money back guarantee on that $450. We'll discount it at $350. If you don't find that that hour was val valuable and you don't leave knowing more than you did when you came in and have some clear steps for you to take action towards your goals, I will give that money back to you. I guarantee that. Uh, in addition, those that are on today uh, to go ahead and, and book, if you book today from today's webinar, we'll also give you an additional $10 Starbucks gift card that's only for those that are from on today's webinar. Again, you can go to www.startplanningnow.com. So book your wealth planning strategy session. And I'd like to open the floor now to the Q&A 
uh, for everybody. Uh, Courtney, do you want to go ahead and read some of the questions that we have there? Yeah, of course. So once again, you feel free to put any questions in the Q&A and I'll be happy to read them and address them. The first question is, uh, so if an individual inherits an estate that went through some sort of bankruptcy or a lot of creditors, they could potentially, is it true that they could potentially be liable for some of those debts? Yes. I mean, so, so sorry, Courtney, is the question is, are they the debts of the person who passed away or the debts of the person who? Yes, the debts of the person that passed. So the debts of the person that passed away, thankfully, will not be uh, a, a beneficiary of the estate will not be uh, subject to those debts. Now, the estate is, though. So, so for example, if, if you have debts and you pass away, uh, the, the extent of the liability that you would have would be your estate assets. Your beneficiaries do not inherit your debts. Uh, so what that means, though, is that let's say I have uh, $500,000 worth of assets and I have $600,000 worth of debt. Uh, that means that my, my beneficiaries do not inherit that $600,000 uh, $600, of debt, the extra hundred. The $500,000 would have to go to pay off the debt, but the additional $100,000 does not pass on to your loved ones though. Now, this is a little different though, if you're talking about the beneficiary. So loved one, you know, you pass away, loved one, mom, dad pass away and leave money to somebody that's either just filed for bankruptcy or is about to file for bankruptcy or has filed for bankruptcy in the last 180 days. Those assets now will be automatically, if the plan's not set up correctly to address this issue, uh, be part of the bankruptcy estate or be subject to those creditors. So that now can be all eaten up to pay for that beneficiary's debts. Okay, that seems to be the sole question, but feel free to add any more if there are additional questions lingering. So anybody have any additional questions? Fantastic. Well, Courtney, why don't you take them away? Tell them how we can uh, how they can reach us if they have any questions, and tell them about some of the upcoming webinars we have as well. Yeah, uh, is that actually does anybody in the, in the audience have any uh, topics that they uh, would like to see for upcoming webinars? We have some schedule we'll talk about, uh, but I'd love to hear if anybody has any. Uh, yeah, if there's any suggestions or if there's any topics fantastic. you're interested in, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q and A. Uh, you can reach us by email info at cheryl-law.com. We're also available on phone 631-506-8440. And we're located in Riverhead on East Main Street. We do have upcoming webinars uh, next month, February 15th. We have Medicaid 101. It's going to be very informative and very important discussion. And feel free to invite anyone that you know that is going through questions about Medicaid, if they have questions about nursing home or even people uh, that have home care aids and things like that, we'd be happy to address it. Once again, it's free. So uh, that will be February 15th. And then we also have an upcoming webinar in March on the 23rd. That's going to be estate planning for parents. So that's also going to be very important protecting the kids. And we'd be happy to also invite anyone you know that has been concerned about this in the past and really just needs to get the planning started so okay. so it looks like we have we have joe in the audience here that's got his hand raised joe if you have a, a question you'd like us to tackle or you have a uh something you'd like us to to be able to answer you can either put it into the q a or the chat and that should be located on the bottom of your screen uh there should be a, a, a pop-up if you see that uh and it's and it has things on the pop-up they're like mute and stop video or you don't have video on your side or mute you probably have a well, q a uh and and chat so if that's something that you want to go ahead and drop into the chat or the Q&A, we'd be glad to answer that for you because you are in, in mute only mode. We'll just give him a second if he's looking to, if anybody else has anything. Um, Okay, the question from in the chat is what can be done if a savings account does not allow a trust to be the owner? So th this is a great question. This is uh, really dependent on the bank, the actual individual institution. 
So you really have a couple of choices. Number one would be change banks, okay? Because it's not a rule of savings accounts that they, it cannot be owned by a trust. And it's not a rule of trust that savings accounts cannot own be owned by a trust. So it might be a bank rule specific to the bank that's holding that savings account. So uh, number one could be changing the bank. If you're against changing the bank, then you can simply just change the account type. I mean, uh, unless that savings account is bringing an enormous amount of interest, which I typically haven't seen in today's market, uh, certainly it does bring a little bit more interest than a checking account, um, but not, I mean, nothing uh, substantial in any shape or form. So you could just change the account at that bank to a checking account uh, if that bank then does allow for checking accounts to be held by a trust. Now, certain banks, again, just have difficulties with trust. They're, they're not familiar with them. or just out of ignorance. Uh, they've had difficulties with uh, certain banks, for example, even opening up guardianship accounts like we talked about earlier on, uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you have to have a guardianship and you have to have a guardianship account, but they just, they're just they're very difficult to work with. So uh, if you're having difficulty with that, I, what I recommend you do is either change the bank or change the account type. All right. All right. Very perfect. good. If there's any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Once again, our next webinar is February 15th, Medicaid 101. And then in March on the 23rd, we also have estate planning for parents. So we look forward to seeing you there. Once again, they're free. If you have any questions about registering, feel free to reach out to me on our phone number, or you can even email me and I'll happy to walk you through the registration. Or if you have any friends that are interested and have questions, I'll be happy to register them as well. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, everybody. Thank have you. a great afternoon. We have one okay. more question that just popped up. Oh, uh, okay. Just to, does the same advice apply to retirement accounts? In so for, for retirement accounts, uh, does the, okay, so retirement accounts cannot be owned by a trust at all. Uh, retirement accounts are tax advantaged accounts that are get those tax advantages for being owned by an individual. Okay, so when, when it's owned by an individual, then it can't be owned by a trust. So what needs to happen in order to put the actual underlying money into a trust, sometimes this makes sense, sometimes this does not, most often it does not, you'd have to liquidate the retirement account, which makes it why it doesn't make sense because when you liquidate your retirement account, you'll have to pay all the taxes on that all in one tax year. So it has a big increase in your income taxes. So unless you're gonna have some savings in excess of that income tax, it doesn't make, it really make any sense. So typically what gets done is setting the beneficiary up as a of, the, of the retirement account to be the trust instead. So instead of the trust being the owner, the trust would then be uh, the beneficiary of the retirement account. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Oh, wait, but I should say, as long as your trust is prepared uh, and provided to, to have that. Now, if we've done that trust, it's, it's gonna have those provisions in there. But before making a decision like that, if you uh, have uh, just a trust lying there that you haven't had reviewed, make sure you have that reviewed to make sure that that's a smart decision. But if we've done the trust, for example, we have pr provisions in the trust that allow for the trust to be basically a conduit to receive the beneficiary uh, of the retirement accounts. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Awesome. All right, thank you. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Everyone right. look forward to seeing you at our next webinar.